you think our world is going to hell and you still oppose nuclear, which is going to give a low carbon footprint, something is wrong. That's what led me to say this is this is not based on sincere objectives for the planet or, or this is not based on you know some scientific method. This is just based on self-interest and political agendas. My guest today is Karthik Krishna. I have a master's in mechanical engineering. I have an MBA, both from Michigan Tech University. Um, my professional career in the US, I was born in India, though I was born in Hyderabad, India, I came here for my master's. Um, I worked at a manufacturing plant in Ohio. And then I shifted my focus to sustainability. I do spend some, put some thought in the titles for my presentations. Uh, you may have seen the, the slide deck that I sent you earlier was about, you know, carbon management. I think it's the biggest enemy of sustainability. I, I came up with this title for this show today. Um, I said environmentalism hijacked by woke al jihadis. A little bit about Krish Energy. So why did I create my com this company, Krish, and what was the, the objective or the goals? Mainly... I'm very passionate about sustainability. Um, I'm trained um, as a sustainability scholar. And I always thought, listen, I mean, we could we could improve our, our lifestyles. We could improve our quality of life um, with the optimal environmental footprint, uh, so to speak. Um, and But the key part there was we need to have some metrics. We need to have some objective metrics on what we can consider as green or not. Um, I also want to promote uh, sustainable lifestyles um, based on genuine um, objective sustainability metrics. And then lastly, what bothers me um, most, um, and this is something that's been happening over the past uh, maybe a year or so since I had discussions with the folks from the education field, uh, our education system is extremely uh, politicized um, and it's corrupting science uh, based on political motives. That for me is just unacceptable. So came up with that as an objective for my startup too. Um, Quite ambitious, but hey, it, it, I'm just stating what what we intended to do. Um, now, I, part of the reason, and I think your audience here would know um, some of the issues, like why why do I say we need objective green um, metrics? It's because you know when you people have uh, there is this whole rapid pandemic, I would say of of the adulterated carbon religion, which uses carbon as a metric for green. Um, which kind of uh, indoctrinates this thinking that uh, carbon dioxide is a climate control knob and it doesn't allow you to question it. Yeah. Um, and then you have people like this, you know, the the, you know, the UN folks and, and the, the young lady next to him, she's actually a, the youngest, like you know, one of the young climate advisors. They're less based on science and most more based on emotions and, and you know, clickbait on some of our... Um, you know, the, the social media platforms to sell their narrative of of, um, of climate crisis, so to speak. So that's, you know, I want to do, you know, what I call neutralize some of this and keep it more objective, try to be objective about this. I've got an engineering background. Um, I, I care about the, the health and the progress of science. And, and uh, I think it's in serious peril and it has been for a decade or so. Now, this is so... The foundation, and I always think, um, you know, you can build great structures, but let's have a good foundation first. So here's the philosophy of sustainability. You know, originally, um, even the term sustainable development came from the 70s with the Brundtland Commission, uh, you know, named after the Norwegian prime minister that says, well, it's about, um, it's to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that's a very high level sustainable uh, development um, sort of definition. Um, you see a picture over there, um, uh, a graphic over there. I picked that up from Colorado School of Mines. By the way, I live in Golden, so I'm you know, about a stone's throw away from uh, from this campus. It talks about you for sustainability. You need to balance the natural environment. You need to uh, balance the economic vitality, and and you know, call something called healthy communities. What they said, and I like that definition. So for me, it's like saying. You want to balance social, economic, and environmental objectives. And that's that's the and the intersection of that is where you would find sustainable development. Now, what I I I came up with this during one of my presentations or, or discussions. Um, I said, um, you know, what's missing in that is the security aspect. I also think what is not secure is not sustainable as well. 
um, you know, and then that's something that I came up with. And, and I think that needs to be added in the philosophy of sustainability. So, for example, if you look at like Germany or Denmark and they do amazing things like this, uh, they they go through the the, the foundation, the, the sustainability principles and build there. And then, you know, uh, uh, President Putin says, nope, I don't like it. And they don't have the security to handle it. They're going to get blown up. Um, so that's just an example. Um, um, but Moving on, I think the most, uh, the biggest, I would say, the the intellectual property that I can claim of, and and I don't know how secure um, it is uh, to my claim, but I came up with this equation that says sustainability is not equal to environmentalism. It's not equal to climate action. And this is fundamentally what's missing in our education system. I think this, if, if you talk to uh, an environmental engineer, um, any top tier university, or I think it's at a basic level. I mean, I think we should, any decent high school student should know this as well. If you ask them the difference between what is environmental um, environmentalism and what is climate action, they should be able to explain the difference, but they do not. They think they are interchangeable. That for me is the fundamental flaw um, gap that I want to address uh, through Krish Energy. That was why we founded Krish Energy. So moving on now, and I try, I came up with this and, and I've got amazing feedback, especially from Colorado Springs community uh, when I give these presentations and 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 uh, Cool Science itself was, um, um, gave me a written letter of endorsement saying, you know, what you're talking about, the way you're talking about sustainability and, and how we need to educate uh, this, um, is what is, is exactly what the American education system needs. And, and I'm uh, proud to have received that endorsement. But I start off with saying, let's ask us our question. So let's say you think you believe, let us make the assumption that you think, you know, fossil fuels are bad, climate, uh, carbon dioxide is the climate control knob, both of, both of which I disagree with, but let's assume that. Do you still think climate risk is the only or the biggest sustainability issue? Um, and I want you know, my audience, um, and especially the, the academic and the student community, think about that. If I say I want to prioritize sustainable materials management or clean air over climate risk mitigation, then you think I'm against the environment? So that's the question I'd like to pose. Because I fundamentally believe, instead of using carbon footprints as a metric for how sustainable we are or how we are, what we're making contributions, whether it's a business or a personal contribution, Instead of using carbon footprints, maybe we should use materials footprint um, as a better way to go. Um, and I and that's something that, again, if you are an environmental engineer or sustainability uh, professional, you need to understand the difference. Now, the other aspect of this, I think it's it's missing, especially um, in America, and, and maybe I could add throw Europe in that basket too. A lot of the discussions on carbon footprints and sustainability, it, it, it kind of avoids or ignores the Asian perspective uh, because you can talk about, oh, I don't want to fly or or uh, I want I don't want to eat meat and then switch to salads because that apparently has lower carbon footprint. If the right side is a graph of the contributions to global carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so if you look at it, and this is you know about five years ago from I picked that up uh, from our UN report. You have China and it is staggering amount of growth. The only two, uh, like the biggest ones that are accelerating in terms of the carbon dioxide emissions are China and India on that graph. Um, you could see US and the EU have either stagnated or, or been in the decline in the past couple of decades, but that is carbon footprint. Now, again, I think it should be relevant, but the fact that they, there's all this commotion and we want to change our lifestyles, make our grid vulnerable, what are we achieving on the uh, on a global scale is a drop in the bucket because we have no means to influence or control the emissions from Asia. So now let's talk about when I say is it if I want air um, if I want to mitigate air pollutants versus I want to mitigate carbon dioxide or if I want clean air first instead of worrying about this um, um, climate risk then let's look at the example of India right now. Now, back in, uh, I think this is 2019, um, the World Health Organization said almost all of India is polluted. Okay, um, And then if you look at 
this, I, I, and I'm quoting some of the most prominent um, and influential Indian media entities. India Today is one of them. Um, a relevant disclosure, my dad worked for India Today a, a few decades ago. <laughs> Um, and then there's the, the the Times group, which said at 2.4 million in 2019, India led the world in pollution deaths. Think about that in terms of when people say climate crisis, it's going to cause, it's going to kill lives, it's going to affect economies, it's going to do this, it's going to do that. Air pollution has already caused millions and millions of deaths. Um, if you think about this statistic, the third bullet down here, um, it says, New Delhi has about 4.4 million children. Half of them suffer lung damage so severe that they'll never fully recover because they're breathing really, really bad air into their lungs. And if you think, um, you know, you hear a lot of stories, Delhi, like Beijing and Shanghai is, is worse. Um, uh, let's just say in, in a very, you know, infamous uh, award for India is it, it has Beijing and Shanghai beat by a country mile. <laughs> but, and, and it's about, you know, again, uh, sometimes the daily air quality is about 15 times worse than what the guidelines are. Why am I saying all this is because the key issue here is air pollution, not carbon dioxide emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. That is, people need to recognize that. Now, Here's, um, uh, you know, I just took some screenshots from the United, um, the U.S. Environmental Project uh, Protection Agency website. So I said, okay, what is air pollution? This is, again, U.S. EPA. These are some of the categories of what it calls are pollutants. There is, you know, carbon monoxide, lead. Um, there is, you know, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide. And if you look at the Indian scenario, the biggest issue is, is PM, which is particular matter pollution. Now, one thing I will say, it's been really hard, and I think, and that's part of the issue. It's been there's been a lack of focus um, on on the sources and and even getting good data on the pollution. Um, and and I think you know if you can't even if you don't have reliable data on where it's coming from, then trying to fix it, it's like applying bandage to bullet wounds. You know, you can't really, you don't, you don't know what you're doing if you don't understand uh, the causes and, 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 and then go about solving it. So to the right side, I'm looking at, um, like this is um, another stat that I picked up from an Indian scenario. So where are the sources of the air pollution? A lot of it just dust and construction. Apparently that's 20, 45%. And I picked this up from Wikipedia. Um, you think about waste burning, that's about 17%. Um, and then then you can add or add the other factors like transport and diesel. So this whole notion that fossil fuels are the biggest enemies and net carbon zero is the way to go. Think about this scenario. Let's say you put nuclear power plants in New Delhi, um, and then you 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 have carbon capture and sequestration technology in there, and then you can say, fine, New Delhi is carbon neutral, but you do not have. Um, any way to control the pollutants from the materials usage, from the poor construction practices, um, from the waste disposal practices, then it's you are going to be living in an extremely toxic, you know, I, I'm going to say the word, you're going to be living in an extremely toxic shithole that is carbon neutral from a technical word. So how so this this notion that everybody that cares about the environment should support carbon neutrality, even with the assumption that it has the climate control knob, it's just flawed and it is just stupid. And that's the the awareness that I want to create. So let's talk about Paris Climate Agreement. You know, the, the other thing, you, I, uh, I'd i say this, uh, when, when President Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, um, I think that was good for, on many different levels, uh, because he basically said, you know, pull out of, um, this basically a, a, a religious cult um, or an anti-science uh, wealth transfer sort of a framework. Um, and here's, but but and he immediately got labeled as anti-environmentalist and, and and against the environment and pro-wealthy, pro-oil, whatever. Uh, but let's do people even understand what what climate agreement is? Um, it's about you know it's about it's created to limit global warming. Again, it's not. There are overlaps between when you can say, well, dirty fossil fuels can also 
cause air pollution. The point is priorities. So it is not prioritizing air quality or water quality. It is prioritizing carbon as a metric. Uh, they, they say the main goal is to keep temperatures rising below 1.5 degrees. But seriously, the, the, there is just such a dearth of knowledge from a scientific side, understanding what influences the climate. Um, and instead of if you are really worried about the the wildfires that you know that wiped out the way the um, the vin the expense of vineyards in California that have you know made people like in, in Greece and Hawaii suffer, then you need to say let's genuinely understand what's causing uh, some of this instead of blindly assuming the fact that it is uh, fossil fuels because you're you're not you're you're not solving the problem and. Oh, let me go back to this. Um, and then, okay. Um, all right. And then each country. Now, the other part about this is that they, they claim, you know, 1.5, somehow we can control our temperatures and especially control it through uh, carbon dioxide as, as a can control knob. And then there's also each country sets their own goals and it's reviewed on a five-year basis. And, and basically it's the, it's the Western global North, so to speak, that picks up the, the tab for all these efforts. So that's what basically climate um, agreement is. Um, the, the biggest con, again, it, it focuses primarily on carbon emissions. And I want to state this, it's actually carbon dioxide emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, but you have to understand emissions is not the same as pollutants. Particular matter, sulfur dioxide, are classified pollutants. Carbon greenhouse gases are right now just emissions with a, a, a theorized or hypothesized view that that somehow causes uh, drastic climate changes. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with it, but I'm saying it. you have to understand the difference between uh, emissions and pollutants. Um, yeah. And then, so let's look at what does when I frame this as saying, if you are an environmentalist, and then you or you want to you want to be a, a climate activist, uh, what is it that you're fighting for? So if you're if you're trying to say I want clean air, you want what's the what are you trying to mitigate? You're trying to mitigate, um, you know, um, the pollutants so you can have better respiratory health and you can have clean air. If you're trying to mitigate climate risk, you're trying to prevent extreme weathers. And you think that carbon dioxide is a climate control knob, which itself is a question mark. So that's you have to understand what the risk uh, in terms of risk. What are you and then what is it that you're trying to mitigate? Um, and then I, I firmly believe in this. Not only has this climate action hijacked environmentalism, it has blind spots that needs to be seriously addressed uh, when it comes from an environmental protection point. And I just gave you the the Delhi example. You know, you can have it as carbon neutral, but a toxic shithole. So um, I'm, I'm not going to read through every of these slides, uh, but I think I'm going to talk just about the last bullet line over here. Um, I, simplistic metric uh, for understanding um, human interactions with nature, that's carbon dioxide. But the, but the key, off late, there's been, a, a, there's been greenwashing and bluewashing that have taken over the Al Greda climate jihad. Now, I will say this. And I, I looked up some of the definition of of, uh, of the word jihad, and, and, and I'm looking at my phone, it's, it's up here. It says it's a crusade for a principle or belief. Um, so that's basically what jihad means. So they believe that carbon dioxide is the kind of climate control knob. They believe that fossil fuels are the enemy, and whoever wants to question that is 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 somehow anti-environment. Um, so that's that's nonsense, firstly. And then they also, there's been so many efforts, uh, both from politicians and from um, corporations, saying that they are doing the right thing or, or green, but it's just marketing and and political mess messaging. The, the other part is blue washing. Now, blue washing is applying a layer of social causes attached to climate action. Whether it does something for the environment or not, um, it is uh, it's it's been prevalent. It's it's spreading like wildfires, um, you know, like the one in Canada. Well, and talking about Canada, this is an actual quote um, back in uh, late eighties from a Canadian Minister of the Environment. Apparently, it says, "No matter if the science of global warming is all phony, climate change provides the greatest opportunity to bring about justice and equality in the world." And this is an actual court. Now, I was at this uh, UN conference in in um, CU Boulder, um, and then I, I personally took this picture. 
I'd say this. God bless those kids. You know, I, they're, they're fellow Coloradans. I love them. I want to bless them. But this is just nonsense if you want to take serious, if you want to be serious about addressing what you think is a climate risk and then talking about, you know, um, social justice and love and equality um, in it. It is it is a very bad, very poor way of, of addressing um, any global challenges seriously. But this is exact, this is a, a, a snapshot of what blue washing is. Now, I call this woke environmentalism. Um, and the reason I say that, I know a, a lot of the wokeness or, or the, the, the discussions on wokeness is somehow tied to the LGBTQ discussions. But I picked up this definition somewhere online, and I, I and I like it. It says, "What is wokeness? It's it's a state of awareness. It's a state of awareness, um, only achieved by those dumb enough to find injustice in everything except their own behavior." And I think that fits the 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 Al Greta jihadis perfectly because they think or they claim to be fighting for environmental protection, which they are not. They're actually harming it because they have corrupted the science. They have corrupted. Um, of the narratives um, and that they've blunted innovation as well. So that's that's why I call it wokeness. I'm gonna um, maybe I'll just skip through a few slides in the interest of time. Um, I want to talk about this though. This is a uh, an important part. I this was an email exchange with someone who's who's a division leader at Los Alamos um, National Lab um, in New Mexico. He is. Um, He's in charge of um, you know all formal conduct of nuclear operations at at the lab. Now, even though this is a, a Department of Energy lab, it, it is one of the most uh, sensitive defense assets uh, that we have in America. And he's someone who was a plant manager at the nuclear weapons uh, plant and stuff like that. So you can imagine the credibility of this person that I um, I had this email exchange with. And this was back in 2020 when the temperatures rose in California and they were just power blackouts, power blackouts. And, and then he wrote this email saying um, that the Los Alamos lab, which covers about the same land, land footprint of DC, lost its California power supply without notice. Um, and, and basically it says, as a result, it'll take a, a while to assess any damage that might have been avoided. And, uh, and, and, and he's, they're talking about the power shedding came with too little notice. It reminded me of growing up in India when I, you know, they, we had less access to power and we would at least have controlled power shedding. We were told when the power would go, when the power would come. But the fact that California, and it was because of, at that time, it was just the temperatures rose and everybody went out to turn on their air conditions and, and they just shut down the grid. Now, it, it, the crazy part was this was before the wildfires just actually hit. It was just heat and that melted down our grid. And I think of it this way, we are, you know, we are the richest, most powerful, most powerful nation on the planet. We invest billions in, in grid modernization, but this, and it's not a coincidence that, and I'm, I'm going to add the, the Texas meltdown um, a few months later in February, that a state that has promoted a large number of solar integration and a state that has claims about having the largest wind generation capacity were the most fragile when it comes to handling any changes. Now, irrespective of whether you think you can control the climate, um, and you have to acknowledge that the biggest carbon emissions are coming from Asia right now, how is it that our grid has become so, so brittle? It's because we are not looking at it objectively. We have made this a case bit of renewables versus reliables. And and I, I, when I talk to a lot of the defense community members, I said, this is not just about politics. This is also a defense issue because if we don't have reliable power supply to our, our sensitive you know, nuclear facilities, then where are we heading? It's something that needs to be addressed, I think, as a, as a defense question too. So uh, again, to summarize, and, and I want to quote uh, this person over here, and I picked this up from a, a news article from the Hindu, uh, back in 2018, um, he was the the head of uh, Mercedes Benz India. Uh, this German, um, and, and he said, you know, you need to learn from Europe's mistakes with EVs uh, because somehow, again, uh, EV has been championed as a poster child for greenness. Um, don't ask for logic there, but uh, it, they say that if you're driving an electric vehicle, somehow you're green. Um, that's uh, questionable, but. 
it's just that's a uh, the what he was saying was if you drive in an on an Indian grid which is heavily coal based and very poor environmental controls, um, if you drive around in what he called the pilot stage um, uh, four uh, emission uh, pollutant uh, compliant vehicles using fossil fuels, you're actually going to have a much cleaner environment than trying to plug into luck in electric vehicles, which the Indian grid is simply not ready for, and it's quite dirty. Um, from the non-pollutant mitigation, not just carbon emissions. Um, so I, I want to just summarize some of these. Uh, I think we need better, better education on the differences between environmental protection and climate action. Um, I think politicians, big corporations, and investors are just exploiting society's concerns for planet well-being. And I think this is both sides. And if you look at it from um, the American perspective, I think they're um, they're both sides that are just exploiting the situation. Um, and I think most Asia has been, and, and um, you know, at the time of maybe over the past year or so, it's been a year. Uh, no, it's been about a year since I was in India, but hopefully they made some changes and shifted their approach. Uh, but they they seemed incapable and unwilling to address their environmental problems. They just want to, they're happy to take all the Western funds as long as they parrot the, the stupid Algrida uh, jihad B narrative. Um, and lastly, we need to understand that more renewables in California and Texas will do nothing to offset the emissions from Asia. So some of the the, the summaries. Um, I do, these are some of the suggestions that I normally give. Um, our education system in America needs a serious reboot, uh, no question. By the way, these two over here in the picture, uh, you see me and my Bob Armstrong, and then those two were interns from University of Colorado, Colorado Springs that worked with my company. Uh, they're both uh, mechanical and aerospace engineers from them. And, and we had fun talking about doing environmentalism, right? Uh, this was during a presentation in, in downtown Springs, though. I want to talk about uh, integrated accounting tools um, just a little bit, because I think that's what we need to um focus on if we are if you want to do environmentalism right um so what do you mean what do i mean by integrated accounting tools uh, i have a couple of examples um to the left over here it's a french company called Kering uh, that came up with this tool uh, they i think they call it like an environmental profit loss tool um they have um if you look at the the bottom over there there are like six different dimensions you know air pollution waste water consume uh, consumption land use and then they look at they're basically looking at fashion products and they come up with an environmental cost for a particular product. And this is how their tool works. Um, you just, you can actually, I think it's fun if you want to just download their app and play with it, but you can pick a product, you can pick the materials, you can pick uh, where the materials came from and where it is manufactured. And based on that, it just gives out an environmental score. Um, now, here's a fun fact. If you if you just look at um, the scores, uh, and I picked the same bag, uh, like a fashion handbag, and, and the left one, it says 52 euros. It's not the price for it. It's the environmental price uh, uh, based on their metric. Um, and then I changed some variables, um, and then um, the, the environmental score, environmental cost went from 52 to 22, so less than half. But the most, the fascinating thing is the biggest factor for this drop in the environmental performance is the fact that I moved manufacturing from Asia to Europe. So think about that. Um, the, so when you when you talk about just making fossil fuels the enemy, I'd say, how about we just, if, they, if you're really worried about climate risk, you should say, we need to bring manufacturing, uh, as American consumers need to uh, um, consume made in America products just because we're gonna have a better environmental footprint. We're going to lower the carbon emissions just because um, China uses a lot of coal. And think about all the emissions from the transportation back and forth. So there's other levers that we can focus on, even if you want to look at um, carbon dioxide as a metric. But we, there, there, there's just this obsession about hating fossil fuels, which is just, um, it, it, is, it is not objective. It is politically motivated. And, and for the last part, for the most part, it is anti-science as well. Now to the right, what I what I have, and this is the uh, proprietary tool that we developed in house at Krish Energy. Um, so the the keying the French tool has like six dimensions. I have um, five dimensions. We call that's why we called it you know the Peacock Pentagon uh, model. And um, 
and and it's very uh, this metric is based on uh, materials usage uh, so if you look at it two of the five dimensions are based on materials uh, use uh, because i divided them into biodegradable material and um, non biodegradable material but it's heavily focused on 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 our materials footprint rather than carbon footprint at all so that's the metric that we developed and and i think that there's just so many different applications for it. And this is the better way to do it. Now, whether you want to use the curing tool or whether you want to use the, the pickup pentagon that we developed, I think this is the way to go integrated accounting tools if you want to do environmentalism, right? Instead of being obsessed with carbon. Last, uh, my closing slide, I do want to give a shout out to um, Dr. Will Happer. Um, I, I want to say this, I, I was involved in some exchange email exchanges with him and that was a quote from one of his emails to um, in which I was involved in. And, and uh, based on that email exchange, I showed up in Florida and, and got the absolute pleasure of you know, being in the same room with him uh, and listen to him. So I do want to give a, a shout out to um, Will Happer. And uh, well, I'll close the presentations and let's chat. One question I had is, um, are you in touch uh, even in the last year with uh, friends and family in India and trying to get a feel for the common people in India, do you think they're buying into this anti-CO2 narrative? Are the common people and the politicians? Any comments on either one of those? I have friends and family I have, um, in, in India. Um, and um, I think the, the, the thing about India is, Although it's changing a lot, when I was growing up, it was just a matter of survival. You wanted to have a basic living, you know, you had to go just go go to UK or US, get a master's and live a better life there and send some money back to you, support your parents. And that's how it was. Um, right now, India, I believe, and this is my personal opinion, and I've had discussions with folks in New Delhi over this. India, I think peer pressure has a big influence in India. So if if Berlin and Paris are saying, well, climate crisis is real and, and Delhi will give you this much funds as long as you parrot this notion, they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, see, we, are, we put up so many solar panels in India and we're doing this, we're doing that for climate mitigation. And, and I tell this to folks, um, I say this, listen, whenever there was rapid industrialization, uh, whether it was in, in Germany, whether it was in the UK, there was there was pain during that growth. You know there were acid rains in Europe. Uh, you, uh, UK had you know some of the worst uh, uh, let's just say hygiene standards when they everybody started rushing to London and living there. Um, but and and I say but they addressed it. They prioritized just and they addressed it. The issue with India right now is, in my view, there's a there's an environmental problem. But in, and India has the talent, India has the resources. It's a matter of priorities because you have to prioritize what is in India's interest from an environmental standpoint instead of parroting the Algreda narrative and championing what Brussels has on its global agenda. So that's just my view. Um, and to add to that, if I, if um, again, if I was in charge of India's environmental protection and I think climate risk and, and I also think, you know what, if there's so many of these global scientists and, and and heads of state saying climate risk is real, then I think, okay, so what's the downside? You're saying that there's going to be catastrophic wealth events. You're saying, you know, st uh, cities like Chennai and, and Trivandrum are going to get drowned or are submerged underwater. Then I will say, okay, then we'll design cities based on Venice and have boats instead of roads. And, and then I'll, uh, but at the same time, I want to prioritize clean air. That's how I would address it. I will, and so I will take the funds from Europe uh, but I will focus it towards mitigating pollutants I, and carbon emissions. If as a byproduct of that is lowered, fine, I'll take it. But that's just my approach. And that's how I'd like India to approach it. But let's just say no one's paying me uh, uh, to say this in New Delhi. No one's taking my word seriously enough. Maybe your podcast will change it. <laughs> Do you see any sort of movement in India to try to run the whole economy on wind turbines and solar panels? Is that politically popular at all? I, I hope it's not. I, I I don't think I'm the best to talk about the uh, the the policy, the thinking, and even the you know, you know which way the winds are blowing. Uh, because I've, I've I'll say this: I've been in New Delhi. I've spoken to folks um, um, from very regarded institutes in Delhi, and they always seem to have gone back to saying, "Oh, but." Um, you know our con our consultants from California, and most of them are just Indian 
um, what you call um, NRIs, which is non-Western Indians, you know, somebody sitting from California, sitting or somebody from Germany or somebody in California says, you need to have electric vehicles and you need to plug them with some trophy wind turbines on the grid. That's what they're going to do and feel good about it. So I, I, I tried to beat my head on that wall for a few times. And then I was like, you know what? I mean, pardon my words. I'm like, you want to go fuck yourself? Go ahead, do it. If someone asks me, I will tell them that is just stupid. That's that's where I am right now. <laughs> so getting back to the U.S., I think uh, we've emailed back and forth and talked that uh, one of your interests is trying to get sanity into schools about the, these issues. And uh, you have been in contact or, you know, uh, Sharon Camp, who was just on my podcast, and she's been working on that, too. Yes. Uh, uh, so Sharon... Uh, I did. We did have a meeting with Sharon. Uh, she she spoke with some of my team members. Uh, we had a meeting to discuss um, K twelve education. Um, and um, firstly, I think CO two coalition what what they're doing is fantastic. Um, um, I but I also think we need more younger generation um, that gets involved because I asked Sharon to be on my advisory board and she's like, you know, I'm retired and then I already am focusing on, on CO2 coalition and it's understandable. And But at the same time, I, I think we need young blood. I think people that are in the beginning of their career, closer to the beginning rather than the end of their professional career to get involved in some of these things on the science education. I do want to say this, though. Unfortunately, I myself am planning to uh, just offload my focus on on science education and just turn that over to um, if Cool Science in Colorado Springs wants to pick it up, then do it. But part of the reason is I feel the bad guys have made billions of dollars selling a lot of the um, the Al Qaeda um, jihadi narrative, but the good guys, whether it's the CO2 Coalition or Heartland, they somehow. Um, they seem like there's a there's a focus on just doing it as a nonprofit, and I don't believe that. I I think if I want to add positive value to society, I want to fix a problem in the in our society. I want to offer a better future for us. I just want a fair price for it. And if there is no, I don't. If that's not being received as you know, good intention but fair intention, then it it doesn't. I'm a I I still want to find avenues where I could um, take care of my financial security and and and, and enjoy the lifestyle that, that I want to enjoy. So I'm not ashamed of it, but I do, I, but I've run into that roadblocks. And so I myself am kind of offloading some of my K-12 educations and, and let other champions pick it up, so to speak. Are you having some luck in, uh, as you talk to various people and getting younger folks uh, interested in this whole uh, sanity thing? Sounds like uh, <laughs> yeah. you do or no? Well, I'd say this. I think there's a lot of peer pressure. Firstly, uh, even um, in the the young people that have, and I've 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 been mentors at like STEM schools in Colorado. Um, I've attended uh, teachers' workshops, science-based teachers' workshops in there. I think even those that realize uh, there is there could be a better way to do environmental protection, and we need to be more open-minded on on how we um, teach kids and perceive kids. There is just so much peer pressure from the mainstream narrative to just sub, you know suppress that it's shocking um and for me i i think that's where a lot of the folks that 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 have openly supported me uh, when i give presentations are folks that quote unquote have nothing to lose they've they've had their uh, professional careers they're they're retired they're, but they're just engaged in the communities and they want to protect the the next generations so that's the ones that speak up um but uh, i think the, the 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 younger generation somehow it's almost they're they against mother nature or against the environment if they question uh the alberta uh, narratives and that's that's sad it's what it is though have you had some success in making contacts with uh, some other folks like when you went down to heartland you were able to meet uh, will happer or I some of the stuff you, it sounded like Brian Gitt. Do you have any connection with Brian Gitt at all? Not Brian, but I did um, exchange some emails with Ron Stein. Um, um, you know, someone that he was on the panel and then he gave me his business card in Florida. And, and of course, you and I know that we were together at that event in Denver um, a few weeks ago. Um, so, I mean, he's, you know, the fact that someone like him, I had direct email exchanges and I'm on his newsletters. Um, so that's that's one thing. Uh, 
Um, the recent panel, and this will be a fun story. I was on this panel in Cool Sinal Colorado Springs, and they, and I loved that because it was it was a diverse. It was to, it was to embrace diversity of views. So there were four panelists. Two of them were from the university, like a director of sustainability and like a professor over there. And then one was um, um, Colorado elected official, like a House representative from Colorado General Assembly member, Ken DeGraff. Um, and and the fourth one was me. Now Ken. He actually introduced the legislation in Colorado saying that carbon dioxide should not be categorized as a pollutant. Uh, firstly, I can't even believe that they, they did that, which is shameful. Uh, but and, and, and I remember, so we had this amazing talk, a wonderful interaction with the community. Uh, and he was telling me at the end of it, he said, you know what, Karthik? I walked in thinking it was just going to be me against these three other panelists. They're all going to gang up on me, and I'm I'm just going to defend what I have my own views because I believe. I mean, I've done my research, and that's what I I I believe in. And I was just pleasantly surprised that you were there not just to support me, but you to you you went on the offensive on, on calling out what these um, uh, climate jihadis are, uh, and so. That's sort of uh, you know talking about the connections and that I've made. Uh, I I think if you are objective, you need to embrace diversity of views, uh, and I think there's there's a lot of room for us to do environmental protection better. So can you talk at all about how you came to be a climate realist yourself? Like, did you have this figured out right away that things that weren't adding up, or were there people who influenced you to figure that out, or, or how'd you do it? You know, great question, because. I've been thinking about that myself, and I want to say that I want to admit, I have a publication in the Energy Policy Journal about a decade ago, and it was actually published under a special Asian Energy Security um, edition. And that publication I wrote with my my professor, environmental policy analysis professor, and we all we spoke about climate action, climate action, and climate this, and you know we need to address global warming, blah blah blah. And I was there, and then. I, when I I think there were certain signs, certain things that made me just stop and then question it. So, for example, when I was in New Delhi and I saw the absolute poor, shameful air quality over there, and I kept saying, "What are you doing?" and they kept pounding about their climate goals. For me, that was a that was a, a stop and think thing. What are they? Why are they doing this? Because they don't care about the environment; they care about the climate narrative. That was like the first thing that started saying. I, that differentiated the climate action from environmental protection. So the Indian scenario, big thing, uh, was what differentiated. I think another one, when I'm, I'm a believer, this is, this is just a, a big fraudulent narrative. And the reason I say that is, then you start analyzing it objectively. For example, if you look at Germany and California, and then the fact that they want to shut down nuclear, right? Um, whether they're risks or not, you have to know nuclear is... It has very little carbon footprint compared to anything else. But for some political reason, um, because maybe it'll kill the wind and solar industry altogether if you actually have nuclear, um, for, for some reason they say, no, 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 we, nuclear is bad too. Then I, then I start questioning, if you really think, if you think climate crisis is an ex existential threat, so that's these are the things, and once you start doing it more and more, um, then, as I said, that's that's how I arrived at what it is. But but my whole focus has been: you can have people believe in whatever they want to. Um, um, but if you, for me, they are exploiting the the sentiments of those who want to have good relations with Mother Nature, who want to have the best um, the you know environment possible. The fact that this climate activism has somehow taken over. That that's the one that I want to fight against. Uh, I think and you know, good environmental environmentalists have to fight, and that's where someone like Patrick Moore is a hero for me. You know, I met him. I, you know, I've, I've read his entire book. His book is sitting here on my table right now. That one, I think his his book is it should be like a bible for environmentalists. I don't agree with every with everything that he says, but that's he makes much more sense from an environmental protection standpoint than any of the climate lunatics out there. So there is this whole narrative, though, that if somebody like you, uh, they want to, they need to make a living. Exxon's just going to throw piles of money at you because you're willing to say stuff uh, in support of hydrocarbons. Uh, what? Why do people still believe that? It's just a straight up lie. I'm just amazed people still believe that that you must be funded by Exxon, even though you're not. 
you know, I, and I, I was, I was thinking about this. I, I would say, let's go. Why be defensive about it? Firstly, no oil company is funding me, but let's say I want Indian oil to openly sponsor me. Indian oil is India's largest commercial enterprise, right? I've been to their R and D facilities. They have, are you know, people think about the Tatas and the Reliance as big, powerful conglomerates in in, in India, but I would argue. Indian oil has the match in terms of the resources, in terms of the finances. If Indian oil wants to sponsor, you know, the, my efforts, wants to sponsor Tom Nelson podcast and show that fossil fuels have contributed positively to society, they can be, I mean, of course, you don't want to, if you want to burn fossil fuels in a way where you're releasing air pollutants, then that's an issue. But overall, how it has improved quality of life, then do it. I I don't I, I think this whole notion that we should somehow be benefiting financially. I think the folks that have benefited most from the Al Qaeda lunacy are the folks that have invested in electric vehicles. Think about the money that they have made by selling a flawed theory. So if you're saying you're saying oh this is all based for money or you're in work, compare the folks that are that you think um, are funded by the oil industry versus the electric vehicle lobby industry. And then talk about it. So uh, and do it openly. I, and I, why is electric vehicles a green uh, a cha- poster child itself is is just laughable. But uh, that's uh, that's that's where I stand. I said do it and compare it compare it to the electric vehicle lobby. You call it oil lobby. Let's compare the the electric vehicle and lunatics then. You know. So yeah, you make a great point there. I, I like that a lot. That I really think Exxon should be funding people to fight back against this scam. But yeah. they're they're not fighting back as near as I can tell. They don't fight back at all. Are you seeing any fight back from Exxon? They're kind of pretending they believe in it. But they believe. No, I, I, I think I feel I feel um, I, I feel you need the right champions for it. You know, you you if you if you can now you know thanks to like you know you look at CO two coalition or you can look at like clientele um, you know climate tell from the Netherlands. You actually have people that have some serious scientific credentials, um, and then you look, you have people um, that are not just politicians um, uh, questioning this climate lunacy. I think now, if it, and you call it, you call it Saudi Amerika, you want to call Exxon, you want to call it Shell. Now, I think they need to back some of these openly, and then let's let's get on stage and debate these. You know, I am not saying I don't think we should be doing this in silos. I don't think because it's going to reinforce our own self beliefs. I'd love to be on panels um, with with folks from the electric vehicle we'll sell the climate crisis crisis narratives. Then I want to question them. You know, and then I want to question people that have made billions uh, by selling this climate crisis lunacy. Yeah, I, I love the idea of debates, and it's kind of too bad because I'm going to publish this podcast right after this debate between Pilkey Jr. and Coonan. They're going to debate net zero. Uh, publicly okay. later on today, I'm going to be watching that and see what is said. But yeah, I would love to see all this stuff debated heavily in public. And uh, hey, um, here's an idea for you know you or any of your audience, uh, Tom. Because I said you know I'm, I've kind of offloaded my my K12 focus right now, um, just because it's it, it's something that um, maybe someone else is in a better position to do it. But if you want to, if someone wants to set up panels with four diverse viewpoints. Um, I think firstly, that'll be a great way to engage with college students, um, uh, engage with uh, the younger generation, but not be one-sided. We can have, you know, one or two on each side and, and have a good moderator um, that can bring in the diverse viewpoints in a, in a positive fashion. Um, if, if you know any podcasters, television hosts, or, 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 or event organizers, I'd love to work with you. You know, that, that's my message to you and your audience. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think we should work on that. Just thinking about this, I saw on Twitter that Steve Coonan was in a couple other debates, I think, in the last couple of weeks even. <laughs> there are, maybe it's moving a little bit towards the direction of debates. And another positive is that Joe Rogan hasn't hosted a direct debate between uh, skeptics and uh, and alarmists. But he had, uh, I think he had Coonan on there, and separately he had Dessler on there. So I think it's really good that uh, he's listening to both sides and having both sides of the debate on his podcast. So uh, th- that that's a plus. I'm you know, w- well, one thing I'll say, maybe one of the one of the ones that I'd love to debate is some of the the power ministry folks from uh, from Modi government. You know, I'd love to question you know what they're doing 
from the from the real environmental crisis in India. You know, that's another one. Like because I, I think once Asia finds its voice, um, I have no question that's where this 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 jihadi bubble is going to burst. The Al Qaeda jihadi bubble is going to burst because. Uh, I felt like, you know, I've interacted with Greg uh, Wrightstone, you know, the executive director of CO2 Coalition. I uh, He knows me. I've, I've interacted with James Taylor, who's the CEO or the president of Heartland Institute. But there's still some way, you know, you, you want to challenge Elon Musk and you want to question Elon Musk, but you won't go all the way because, you know, he still made billions for America. He still made American manufacturing cool again. But I think if you start, you know, if someone from New Delhi says, listen, I have you know, millions of children in India breathing poor air quality and our education system is being rotten because of this climate lunacy, that's when you will get a serious challenge, I think. Um, you know, so um, I'd love to debate on a global level. I'd love to debate those folks from um, from Germany and Brussels, you know, that talk about all this, this climate goals and they've hijacked this UN agenda for climate mitigation. I mean, I'd love to debate them, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this quote just hot off the presses from Elon Musk on climate change, quote, we also don't need to be alarmist about it and super negative and massively disrupt people's lifestyles. I mean, I think people can continue to live a normal life. And they shouldn't be guilty about being human or sort of, frankly, having a stake. It's fine, end quote. I think that coming from Elon Musk, that's encouraging, wouldn't you say? See, from- I, I, I'll say this. I may disagree with him on a lot of things, but I have a lot of respect for what he's achieved. But I and I also think, you know, see, it's just it's marketing for him. If he says his product is a green champion and people are buying it, he can be blamed for the naive crowd that have done it or the the self-interested the the investors that have pumped in billions and uh, for that for Tesla. I think the issue here is there is no body to protect um, or look at it objectively. Um, uh, and that's, uh, you can tell politicians with with good marketeers from the corporate side. So but it's not Elon's issue that he, see, I can come up with this and I can say, hey, Krish Energy needs to be valued at a trillion dollars right now. And my Peacock Pentagon is the best solution for it. I should be allowed to say that, but some we need to have some sort of checks and balance in society to say, okay, uh, there's, you got to take that with a pinch of, uh, you know, grain of salt, so to speak. Uh, that hasn't happened with the, uh, with the electric vehicles. So to, to, to Elon's point, he's all, he's long said, you know, there is no way that fossil fuels are going to be, we, there's no way we can eliminate fossil fuels from our society. He said that, and he, he can afford to say that because people, the, the green lunatics have, have, invested so much in electric vehicles and he is a, what what sells it so to speak um so well i mean but at the same time I, you know if he says if elon says i i revived american manufacturing i made it cool again uh, i think my vehicles are sexiest things that you can drive on and i'm making money out of it that's even that's the next level just honesty you know do that but the green lunatics would say no 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 we want to. We want taxpayers' dollars and in, in, in invested in charging vehicles, because we've we've tagged it as something that's green, which it is not. But hey. All right. Uh, let's see. Any other points you'd like to make before we go ahead and finish this one off? Well, top of the hour. I just want to say thank you, Tom. Um, I know you were in some of my internal team meetings as well. Um, I do want to. I'm. You know, I'm, I'm just looking at new, some new things, new ideas myself. You know what my um, interests are, expertise is, or my views are. So if anybody in your audience wants to reach out, work collaboratively, collaboratively, um, I'd be very interested. Um, I'm still go do a retreat in New Zealand and Switzerland next year and, and just chill a little bit. So um, still trying to find the right team and, and be financially secure as well. So um, any ideas, any collaborative interests from you and your mem- members would be very welcome. All right. So thank you very much. I'm very encouraged that the younger folks like you are uh, speaking out in a, such a sane <laughs> manner. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Have All right. Day. Talk to you next time. All right. Goodbye.